And as I introduce this series, please pay, pay particular attention so that as we share the word, may the Lord God himself speak to you through his word. Now, in the world we live in, uh, it's just that as human beings, we want to live well. And, uh, you know, it's in our nature to want to live well. I believe God wants us to live well. However, in the quest to live well, we are always pulled in different directions. You can be pulled to seek prosperity or to seek humility, to experience ease or to experience adventure, to live indulgently or to live intentionally, uh, to take all that the world offers or to live the world better than we found it. So all these um, things are pulling us this way and that way. Also, the many voices of society, not to mention our own instincts, call us in directions, different directions. What should you do? However, this morning, Jesus invites us into his direction, the direction we must follow. And you may be wondering, how, how did I come to that? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 18 to 19, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is what the scripture says. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be sharing up, they'll be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. That's God's word in 1 Timothy 6, 18 to 19. Jesus invites us to live well by living generously. That is why as a church we have chosen to spend the next four weeks uh, going through a series that we are we have entitled Living Generously. Now, Living Generously isn't merely another teaching series about money. It's about learning to invest your soul wisely, manage your opportunities intentionally, and spend your money on things that matter. It's about living a life that will live beyond us. So to begin the series, I have a question for you. Have you ever made an investment that paid off big time? How did it feel when you got the return on your investment? Obviously, you must have felt happy. You must have, you must have been delighted. Maybe you purchased shares in a company and their value increased exponentially in a short space of time. Uh, you then got a big return on your investment. How, would you, how did you feel? Obviously, you were very happy. Uh, many examples. Maybe you went to Mozambique, bought a stock of your business and b brought it back in here. And in time, in no time at all, there, there was so much... Uh, profit coming from what you sold, obviously, you felt very happy with that investment. Maybe you made a New Year's resolution to spend one hour in the gym every day. You have been consistent and you are finally seeing the results. You know, you can see that you are fitter, healthier, and back to your original self. How does it feel? That's what we mean by investment. Now, why? <clears throat> now, I want you to imagine an investment whose return is eternal, whose reward 
if you got it, you would enjoy forever. How much joy do you think that kind of investment could give you? An investment that gives eternal rewards. How rich do you think it would make you? How much peace and security do you think it would give you? I'm sure you can realize that you enjoy forever what you invest in eternity. What's my point in all this? Why am I making us imagine all these things? Well, I want us to know that no one can give you a better deal than God. As real as joy is when we receive temporary rewards for investment in temporary things, it is nothing compared to the joy we will receive if we invest in what is eternal because we enjoy it forever. So if you are in the house and you want to learn the wisest way to use your money, this message is for you. To be confident, uh, you have rewards, not regrets, when you die and go into eternity, this message is for you. To overcome fear, worry, and anxiety around money matters, this message is for you. So in today's message, we'll learn how to invest our money in eternity and guarantee our soul the reward of eternal joy. Let us pray. Lord God, our heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love, for your mercies which are new every morning. Lord, I pray that you speak through me and you speak to us all. May your word, Lord, say something we have never heard before. May your word, Lord, teach us so that we will know that it's you speaking to us. Holy Spirit, Soften our hearts in areas where we have hardened our hearts. May we receive your word. May our hearts be fertile ground on which the word will grow and produce fruit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the message title in this series, Living Generously, is Investing in Your Soul. Investing in your soul. Our main scripture for this morning's uh, message is Luke 12, verses 22 to 34. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. You can follow along. Let's listen to the words of Jesus. Then, turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so much, so wonderfully for flowers that they have, for what they, they have here today, and yet they are thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. 
Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and you, he will give you everything you need. So, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the, the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. That's the end of the scripture. <clears throat> Sometimes when you read God's word, it's like, you know, it's like you feel like, uh, is, this, is this the Bible or is it just me speaking? Uh, we all worry about things like money. So I've been worrying maybe since 1980. You get your salary. So imagine 1980, this is 2024, right? So this scripture is saying, you don't, you don't go through what I was worrying in 1980. You start not worrying now. <laughs> so in this passage, Jesus uses a material reality to point to the spiritual reality. It's not confronting an income issue, but an idol issue. So, Let's hear what God is saying to us, to you and to me. He's showing us that idols like money replace God in our minds or in our hearts and derail us from flourishing and meaningful life God created for us to live. They stop us living on purpose for a purpose. You know, when I read this scripture... Now with social media, I'm able to, you know, I'm here in Eswatini. Um, I lived my earlier life, my younger life in Zambia. Sometimes when I read the posts, I can't believe it's like it's me and my colleagues in 1981 complaining about the government. Now this is 2024. The posts of these younger people now, it's like they are saying exactly what we're saying <laughs> in 1982 or 1980. In other words, what Jesus is telling us here is that it's the way you see, you know, you, 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 you may think that you are, you are being wise, you know, by thinking in a certain way concerning money. But God is teaching us something to say that the wisdom is from the Lord. God doesn't want us to, 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 to suffer. God doesn't want us to worry. And worrying is not good at all. When we find freedom, the trap of money, and then we use it as a tool to serve God, we are investing in the wealth of our soul. An investment in eternity. Through the many illustrations uh, that he gives, Jesus is teaching us here is this. We will enjoy forever what we invest in eternity. If we follow what Jesus is teaching us here, we will invest in things that will bring joy in our own soul, to our own soul forever. This is the teaching this morning. In verse 31, he commanded us to seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give us everything we need. Uh, I will use again myself as a testimony. <laughs> if I'd read this verse in 1980, uh, I would have said, no, that, that's, that's, that's not true. Uh, 2024, I believe with all my heart that God has given me, is giving me everything I need, which is contrary to the way I was worrying so much that time. My worries were so much about money. This verse seems to, uh, to be like, it's unrelated to the theme of discourse in, this, uh, in, in, our, in our message this morning. 
Uh, in fact, uh, it's like it's not what we want to hear, but the fact is that it is central to our message this morning. By adding this command in this context, Jesus is teaching us that one way to invest your money in eternity is by using it first for the kingdom pursuits rather than your own. It is as we prioritize these kingdom pursuits in our spending that God turns around and gives us everything we need. As a result, two beautiful things uh, have happened. Firstly, we have invested our money in eternity, ensuring that the returns we will get from it will last forever. Secondly, we have made room for God to step into our circumstances. Identify what we are lacking and give it to us. Our part to play in all this is to figure out how to spend our money in such a way that we invest it in eternity. From the scriptures, we learn that there are three ways of doing that. And we'll spend the next uh, few minutes uh, to find what these three ways are. So, what the scripture is teaching us this morning is that we must invest in eternity. What, how should we do, do this? What should we do? The first thing to do is to exercise faith-driven spending not hindered hoarding, faith-driven faith spending. Now, in verse 28, B. Jesus asked a question, how, how do you have so little faith? That word there is for a reason. It is through becoming more faith-driven in how we spend our money that we invest in eternity. This is what the Bible means when it says it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. The first step to becoming faith-driven in our spending is to pay our tithes faithfully. So the first step is to pay our tithes faithfully. Also, honoring our financial commitments, even when it is inconsistent, uh, I mean, even when it's inconvenient. Let, let me give you an example of what this uh, is saying. I mean, let me uh, expand it a bit to make you understand. There are some employers, this is what happens. So this employer, maybe it's a manufacturing company, it's a private school, when they get the income, this is now they sit down, then they make the calculations. Then they find that if they were to pay all their workers their wages, there will be no money left. Right? So because of that, they won't pay. So they'll tell you, ah, if you can wait, we'll pay you. So already, if it was you, you know, you are already sinning. The Bible says the worker deserves his wages. But you know why you are not paying? It's not that you are, you, are, you are being foolish, but you are thinking, you see, you have no faith. So I think that, look, if I pay them today now, what, what, will, ha what will remain in my account? You understand? That there are times when you, you owe someone 100 rands or 200 rands, and when you open your wallet, what is in your wallet is exactly that amount. Give them. <laughs> Give them their 200. You owe them. In other words, you borrowed from them then have faith that God will provide for you. Pay your workers on time when the cash flow is low. Paying your debts according to the repayment plan. And then believe that God will provide for you. As I said, it's, it's amazing. This, these are godly principles. They work all the time. During my first few years of working here in Eswatini in 1992, 
You know, we'd go in the staff room and look at the bills that have come from uh, Lewis and the other shops. My colleagues would take the, the, the bill and throw it in the dustbin. I'd say, but that bill, it's, it's telling you how much you're supposed to pay this month. Now, at that time, I didn't know that I was following God's word, so I would be paying every time according to what the bill said. Then they gave me a present when my, my, my bill was over. Now, that is a present here on earth, but I know that my eternal present is bigger and higher. Amen. Amen. You should be re refusing offers to make money in dishonest ways. Because once you do that, you don't have faith. You are believing that that's the only way you are going to make the money. Charging our customers fair prices, not exorbitant ones. The people who charge exorbitant prices, you see, they don't have faith in God. So they think that, well, the best way for me to make, so, to make a profit or to make more money, I know these chickens, others are selling them for 90, but me, I will sell them for 150. When you do that, then you are not spending your money wisely. What changes do you need to make in your life in order to grow a faith-driven spending? Faith-driven spending. I have 200 runs. I meet someone. I owe 200. I should give them and believe that God will somehow put another 200 back into my wallet. Another way is to express your love to others by being generous. Express your love to others by being generous. In verse 33, Jesus commanded us to sell our, position, our possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. This command teaches us that it is through using our money to express love to others that we invest in eternity. This is what the Bible means when it says uh, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11 verses 1 to 2. I'm reading from the uh, message translation. Be generous. Invest in acts of charity. Charity yields high returns. Don't hoard your goods. Spread them around. Be a blessing to others. This could be your last night. See, when I read this, it's like I'm feeling, no, this is not the Bible. Maybe someone else is just talking. You can check it up. This is God's word. But it's the principle. The principle of being generous. Show your love to others by being generous. So, examples are many. It depends on uh, where you are. Uh, pay the school fees for your sister's children uh, who recently lost, maybe she lost her job. You can put yourself in whatever is your situation where you can show love by how you spend your money. Offering to pay your friend's meal when you go out eating, purchasing a pair of sneakers for an orphan uh, in the community. It can be anything. The point is, spend your money wisely. Here at Liberty, one opportunity that exists for you to do this is the opportunity to give towards what we have as care fund. So the envelopes are marked care fund. Now you'll be wondering, care fund. I've already paid my tithe. Now it's showing care fund. So when you put money into the envelope and indicating that you are giving for care fund, by giving towards this fund, you are expressing your love to fellow members of the church during the times when they need help the most. That's what you are doing. And you are spending your money wisely. What would you do to express love this week by being generous to others, to those around you? And finally, we are supposed to extend God's kingdom by giving to help spread the gospel. This is in the Bible. Take a moment to think of one person you know and love and that person does not have a relationship with Jesus. Now imagine how much peace they would have if they heard the gospel and begin following Jesus. You know, at one point I used to think that uh, you see, everyone has heard the gospel. I mean, you go on the kumbis, people are 
you know, it's like a, everything is being played around on, on social media. But you see, you would be surprised how God's word speaks to us. It could just be that particular person who is preaching that day. And the person, like you say, I've, I've heard this so many times that I can't believe how clear, how clear it is to me today. <clears throat> how much better could their lives be if you give towards the vision offering, for instance, here at church? This is what the Bible... Now, this, this scripture is from the Bible. This is what it says. Philippians 1, 5. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, you have been my partners in spreading the gospel, I mean the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. In which way were the Philippians his partners? It's in the same way that Liberty Church Manzini, when we give, and it helps just to run the church, to, 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 to do the things that we do for Jesus, to preach the word, to have our pastors taken care of. The apostle Paul actually asked for prayers. Pray for me. Imagine, you'd think that the one who wrote the, the, um, the, the, the letters in the New Testament, the letters that we read, Galatians, Romans, surely didn't, he didn't need prayer. You know, everything was there for him. No, he did need uh, um, prayer. The reason is that spreading the gospel, if it was something where I don't need prayer, then you wouldn't have asked for prayer. So, how are you spending the, your money in making sure that the gospel is being preached? Don't be misled thinking that everyone has heard the gospel. Some people have heard the gospel wrongly. So, like, let's take it someone who is 30 years old. So, since they were 20, all the people who have spoken to them about the Bible have been saying something wrong, something that doesn't make sense. So it could just be that that day, it could be today, that's when they have heard the scriptures being explained properly, correctly. And then he says, I didn't know this. All this time I didn't know this. So, for instance, here at Liberty Church, the vision offering is an opportunity to invest your money in extending the kingdom of God by partnering with the rest of the Liberty Church family to spread the gospel. And the rewards of that investment are going to be enjoyed by your soul in heaven forever. So prayerfully consider giving towards the vision offering. The message for us this morning is that the way we look at money, you can either see it as an idol or you can see that it is something that you can use to live a life where you are doing what God wants you to do. Worrying. We all worry, but God is saying, don't worry. You see, when you don't worry, it means you now have faith in God. So sometimes what makes us not be wise in the way we spend the money is because we are worrying. And God is saying, don't worry. Go back to the main scripture, the birds in the air, the flowers. Don't be that person of little faith. Put your faith in, in God and believe that he will meet your needs. And show that by the way you spend your money. As I said, sometimes it looks like, you know, the, the, the preacher is just trying maybe to, to make me see this so that I can give or I can respond. But you see, I want, you to, I want God to speak to you and feel that God has said something to you individually concerning money. What has God said to you this morning concerning money? For me, I can safely say God has told me not to worry about what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to, uh, to eat. 
He's not, he hasn't told me that don't buy a shirt. Otherwise, if I didn't buy a shirt, then how would I be standing here without a shirt? But worrying is those things which we do, we know. I mean, things which don't make sense in the way we are thinking. And that we should get our priorities right. Pay your tithe is 10% of your income being the first expenditure. When you do that, actually, you are showing that you have put your trust and your faith in God because you are being obedient to the word of God. Now, as I've said, this topic is not just a topic about spending or about money. It's about our souls. Jesus Christ came so that everyone, everyone can receive salvation, that no one should perish. That is the biggest, the most important reason why Jesus came. So having preached on investing in our soul, uh, I would be disobedient to the Lord if I finish my sermon without making an altar call. We make the altar calls every Sunday, but according to the word of God, even if one person repents, just one person, there is rejoicing in heaven. So as we are seated here, first of all, maybe let me end by saying, it's so good to see everyone. And Liberty Church Manzini, uh, according to the elders, you are doing very well in giving. Please continue. So God wants us to continue, right? God is reminding us to be doing what we are doing, to continue. But I would be making a mistake by me assuming that everyone sitting here has received salvation. That would be a mistake unless I can confirm because God would say, why didn't you make the altar call? So for that reason, I'm making the altar call just in case there's someone. I mean, I, I, I can't see everyone. I can't see everyone's heart. God is not indifferent to our material needs, but he cares about our soul because our soul is the real us. That is why he sent Jesus. So this morning, by choosing to follow Jesus, you are investing in the eternal salvation of your soul. 